so first of all, I did want to shape the context that I work for the uh, International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. We are uh, have a focus, of course, on maize and wheat-based systems, but I do want to stress uh, it's maize and wheat-based systems. So as, as maize and wheat is never or almost never grown alone, we look at the whole system, we look at crop rotations and as such at other crops, but always our entry point is maize and wheat. So just to, to set the scene, by 2050, uh, wheat demand in the developing world is uh, projected to have to increase by 60% uh, and, and, and wheat demand, and maize demand by 100%. So I think um, we have a big challenge. We are already, all of you are already embedded in that challenge. Uh, it has to do with changing diets. It has to do um, with, of course, more people walking around on the globe. So our demand is increasing, but also our carrying capacity to produce that food uh, is uh, reducing because of soil degradation, because of climate change. And I'm just, for your interest, showing here uh, projections of 80 different uh, models up to 2050. And on the left-hand side, and that for Mexico, as this is the country where we're going to be uh, looking at. So if you look at the left, you can see uh, the the reddisher you are, the higher temperature uh, we will get. Uh, and the right side, I actually don't know, can you see the arrow? Um, no, you can't. Okay. So uh, and on the right side, there is the... the um, okay. Uh, and on the right side, there is a, 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 a map of... Um, of Mexico uh, that pr pr predicts uh, the rain, changes in rain, and as you can see, uh, most is reddish uh, orange, which means a reduction in rain projected. There's only one area uh, where we are more green, but unfortunately, that area only has um, whales, cactus, and and some tourists walking around. So that will not help a lot with the uh, production of maize and wheat. Okay, so uh, we uh, like I said, just again to, to and I know this is probably um, not needed for this group, but I still want to set it straight that we consider conservation agriculture as comprising three basic compo components: soil surface cover in the rational amount, minimal soil movement, uh, and crop uh, rotation. And of course, the, of course, those crop rotations have to be economically viable. Um, so uh, how are we going to apply those uh, basic principles or those basic components? That's going to depend on uh, where you are. So if we can move to the next slide. As you can see at the next slide, what we basically want is to move from the situation in the left towards the situation in the right. And we want to move from a situation again in the left where there's no residue applied uh, to, this, to the situation in the right. And here I want to highlight, especially for those arid areas, the left side is 100% zero tillage for more than 15 years. So that's not conservation agriculture because there is no residue uh, left. And I will stress that also in the rest of my presentation. And like I said, we want viable crop rotations. What is very important uh, to me and I don't know if this is happening with you guys also, but some of the pictures were lost. The conservation agriculture principles, we added one more, which is not really a principle, but something to take in mind, that the system also economically has to be uh, viable and economically uh, for the farmer. And economically can mean that he gets more money uh, if he's connected to a market but it uh, can also uh, mean that he gets better and more high quality uh, food uh, for his family. But the component has to be taken into account. We will just uh, go on. That definitely means that this is probably one of the most important slides that we have in this PowerPoint as it was taken out. Um, I can send it to everybody uh, uh, later on. Uh, basically what I'm trying to present in this slide, uh, and it has a nice picture of um, four squares with those four principles, crop rotation, uh, residue retention, and uh, minimal soil movement added that this is generating a, a better working system or with a higher economical or a higher or better return depending on what the objective of the farmer is. But it is important to stress that on top of those principles, 
we have to add, and there were a nice little egg uh, representing each of those of those um, of those components. Now we still have to uh, include um, best uh, nitrogen management, best uh, weed control, best adapted machinery, um, best uh, crop varieties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. We lay the principles, and on top of those principles, the best management practices have to be um, embedded. I'm going to talk about two, uh, two sites in, uh, in Mexico where we are working. The big advantage I have in Mexico is that um, we have a, 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 a lot of variability within the different management systems. I'm going to talk about the one in El Batan, we call it, which is in the center of Mexico, at 2,250 meters above sea level. And it's a rain-fed highland system. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the system in the north, which we call Ciudad Obregón, which is only 40 meters above sea level, and it's an irrigated wheat-based system. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, what we're trying to do in those both sides is to do strategic research based on long-term and component technology trials. The results I'm going to show come from two trials. One started in 1991 and the other one started in 1993. We do that in different environments or in different uh, agroecological settings. Why do we do it? Because uh, through the contrasts and similarities, uh, confronting uh, the different uh, learnings from the different areas, we uh, hope to move to a process level, where we really understand the processes that uh, are underlying CA, or conservation agriculture, so that we have a better decision-making uh, process when we move into a new area or when we uh, start working uh, or work with farmers. It also keeps our thinking flexible. In many of the areas I've seen that people say things should work this way because um, it works that way in my area. Well, if I do that and I take a decision in one area and I take it to the other one, then most of the time it's, uh, it can lead to a complete failure. So like I would say to my students and to my, to my trainees, when I work with them, there's one golden rule that normally costs you $5,000, which is the first answer you give if you are a good agronomist and they ask you a question is, it depends. It all depends on where you are. It depends on what the situation is. But that doesn't mean that we cannot analyze and get to the answer. The big advantage we also have in uh, Obregon, in the city of Obregon, or in the side of Obregon in the north, is that we can mimic environments because we're in the middle of the desert. So if we don't apply water, we have uh, we, we can we can play with amounts of, of, of rainfall. We uh, uh, arrange a network of excellence around those uh, platform trials or long-term trials and use it also as a center of training to from there then go on to on-farm trials. But I'm today only going to present results from the uh, long-term experimental trials. There's just a couple of pictures where I just want to show that CA can come in different reincarnations. This is a typical CA plot for uh, an arid area where you have full sand, full uh, wheat crop. Uh, it was sown right after May. If you go to the next slide, you have again a wheat crop, but this time it's put on, um, on a bat system. Where, uh, which is typically uh, ideal for flood irrigated situations, so you can guide your water through the furrow. If you go to the next one, it's another uh, way of doing CA where we're working with broad beds, and we put six rows of uh, wheat on top of that broad bed, which is typical for an area where we have access of water. But all of it is a way of doing uh, conservation agriculture within the setting and the boundaries of each of the agroecological conditions. We can go now to the next one, Maria. Uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit quickly the characteristics of the El Batan area. It's a non-equatorial, semi-arid highland area, rain-fed agriculture with periodical drought, periodical water access, wind and water erosion, and the overall grain yield for maize is less than 2 tons per hectare in the farmer field. Typical system there is a, uh, can be main, maize bean rotation. There's also some small uh, grain in the system like wheat, uh, barley for the brewery industry, and some oats, etc., as feed for the animals. The system goes from animal traction up to a uh, small uh, tractor, uh, tractor uh, powered uh, implements. 
we, uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see uh, a graph for the rainfall. So we have around uh, 500 millimeters of rain. So for some of you, that's going to be arid. For some of you, that's not going to be arid enough. But you have to compare and take into account that we also have a potential evaporation uh, of above uh, 1,200 millimeters. And this is because we are very high. So um, uh, we, are, we are at a high altitude. Uh, altitude sorry. Um, which means that potentially you lose a lot of the water through evaporation. So that's one of the limiting factors. Uh, also, we are getting uh, rain showers in concentrated rains in the afternoon. Um, and the soil is the haplic uh, feozem, which is indeed a relatively fertile uh, soil. So results may be a little bit more extreme when we go to less to soils that start from less carbon. The soil was formed as an X lake. Uh, um, so there was a lake before in that area. That's why the organic matter built up. But uh, if you analyze the target area, where is it relevant for, and which is the next slide, uh, if Maria can change it for us, then we can see, you can see the green dots is where uh, we can uh, we consider a sufficient uh, similarity uh, from the area where we are working. So if you can go to the next slide, we uh, are going to look at some treatments. The treatments that we are going to compare is zero tillage versus conventional tillage with and without residue, and then uh, maize, 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 wheat, wheat, maize, and wheat, wheat rotations. Uh, remember, we only have one crop a year, and then in the winter, we have a complete uh, bare field, so we are not putting any crop. If you compare all those different combinations, or if you combine, sorry, those different combinations, we uh, are going to look at, at such as 16 uh, different uh, plots. So those 16 different plots were implemented since 1991 and never changed. 